Well, welcome everybody, thank you for coming. Um, this event is sponsored mostly by the Social Science Baja. Uh, Fulbright is involved because Professor Stewart is a Fulbright scholar in India. Uh, my name is Tom Robertson, I'm the director of the Fulbright office here in Nepal. Um, I'm also an environmental historian, uh, and I will give a brief introduction to environmental history, but also, more importantly, to um, our speaker. Okay, my phone is doing crazy things. Sorry about that. This is a reminder to me to remind you to turn your phones off. This was all previously planned. Um, all right. Uh, environmental history um, can be uh, summarized in a few different ways. I mean, it, it grows out of the environmental movement that em emerges uh, around the world, but in the United States um, in the 1960s and 1970s. Environmental history, I think, is a kind of sympathetic ally to the environmental movement, um, meaning it is often quite critical of the environmental movement, but it does try to place uh, and to say, to place the environment at the center of the story in the way that it's not often um, in the stories we tell about history. Um, I think that uh, you can think of it as the relationship between humans and non-humans. Um, in particular, I think that when we tell that story, we often focus on human destruction of nature, but environmental historians are interested in that story. Of course, it's a crucial story. That's, in some ways, the narrative that comes out of the environmental movement that gets them interested in environmental matters in the first place. But then there are also environmental historians are committed to history and accurate narratives about history. And I think in looking at history, history of relations between humans and non-humans, and um, I think historians, environmental historians, find that the story of destruction is not the only story that can be told, and in particular, they like stories that show that nature is an actor. Nature is not always a passive victim. Um, and I think that's a theme that runs throughout our, our speakers, uh, the work of our speaker tonight. Um, so you can think about, the fancy way to say that is that nature has agency in history. Nature has the power to influence events. It's not always a passive uh, victim. Um, so you could recast the way I just formulated environmental history as relations between uh, humans and non-humans. You could recast that as negotiations between humans and non-humans. Uh, in the sense that both pieces have some form of power and leverage in this complicated negotiation. Uh, which is also, I think, a, a theme that runs throughout our, our uh, Professor Stewart's work. Let me um, now turn and introduce him. He's a professor of history, of environmental history at Western Washington University. Um, uh, he's been in India for um, about four months, several months um, this year. Uh, working in Goa at the Bits Palani um, Goa um, University. Yeah, it's an institute. Um, researching the development of environmental history as a field in South Asia. That means interviewing people like Ramachandra Guha and Mahesh uh, Radharajan. Um, I asked Mark a little bit about how he, about his background and how he came to environmental history. Uh, and he pointed out that um, he comes from a rural community uh, in the Pacific Northwest. 
um, of the United States. Um, and in particular, he mentioned working as a um, field hand at a government agricultural station when he was, was that in high school? High school, yeah. Um, and that got him thinking about how complicated the relations uh, between humans and the environment can be, and in particular about um, labor in landscapes. Um, he is an expert in many different um, aspects of human-nature relations. Um, in particular, rice. Uh, he, he did his graduate work, graduate work in the far opposite corner of the United States from where he grew up. Uh, he worked in Georgia. So the Nepali equivalent would be he grew up in Umla and did his graduate work in Java. Um, and uh, got interested in um, Georgia. He w went to, he did his PhD at Emory University in Georgia. And got interested in plantation agriculture, which was a dominant part of the, uh, the economy and landscape of um, the entire U.S. South, but Georgia in particular. And there, the story is not one of cotton, which you hear, uh, which is the first thing you think about when you think about plantation economies in the U.S., but it was a story of rice. And he turned his dissertation into a, a well-known book that I have used pieces of in my own courses. Uh, the book is called What Nature Suffers to Grow, Life, Labor, and Landscape on the Georgia Coast. And in particular, he's very interested in um, how a rice-based economy uh, was able to get established uh, in that environment, and it, it, even more particularly, interested in the intersections of labor, um, power, and landscapes. So the relationships of African American slaves, who many of whom had knowledge about growing rice, um, the relationship between the African American slaves, the landscape that they were transforming, and um, the plantation owners, who were uh, white plantation owners. Um, he's also written, on, I mean, he's written on a lot of subjects, but another um, subject he has written about is cattle and the introduction of cattle to the Georgia landscape. Unusually for American historians, He's done a lot of work outside of the United States, in particular in Vietnam, where he went to teach originally. But because of his expertise in rice uh, and rice landscapes, he started researching and writing about uh, the Mekong Delta in, in South Vietnam, and has published um, several things related to that work. Uh, he's in addition to all those um, works of, of scholarship and the, the teaching in various places around the world, most recently in India, he's a series editor of a series called Flows, Migrations, and Exchanges. With, with all of these, I, I, I love uh, the fact that um, I mean, what Professor Stewart does I think is very different and very needed, very different than what is often done. What his conception of what history is all about is so very different than political history, which is the normal kind of history that we hear a lot about. Um, and with each of the, the titles of his books and works and the subjects he's written about, it's just so uh, conspicuously um, present and important, I think. Oh, yeah. I would like to see uh, books with some of those same titles written about Nepal, Life, Labor, and Landscape, um, in one district after another in Nepal. It would be absolutely fantastic and important. Um, his current subject is the environmental history of food. Uh, I asked him, and I, I will get 
to, uh, I will actually let him talk at his own talk today. Um, but I did ask him what made him, what special qualifications he had for this subject, and he said that he had been gardening since he was a little boy. Um, he also has 46 years of, um, what would be the rough, of producing compost um, to use in his gardens. There are probably people in this room since composting has, has been quite common and traditional in Nepal. Um, people in the room who have longer histories. Yeah. But um, uh, I think that does give him, at least in an American context, a particular perspective um, that's unusual on these issues. The history of food has become quite um, interesting and important in the United States. As, um, as Americans are thinking more and more about what they eat, and as they think more and more about their relationships with the environment, and food, it turns out, is absolutely central to those environments. And I think we'll, have, we'll, we'll get many examples of how that is true. So, with that introduction to environmental history and to Professor Stewart's work, can I hand it over to him, please? Can we um, thank him one more time? Thanks so much for that generous and expensive uh, introduction. It's always interesting to hear what uh, other people have to say about me. Um, even when they allow me to write part of the bio in, in, uh, that they're going to use. Um, I'm probably going to raise my voice in a few minutes here, so let's not get this too close. Um, no, I really appreciate it. And, um, I, you know, as, as Tom mentioned, I've had a somewhat varied background that nonetheless has had a, um, a central set of interests. Um, I, that, I, that, have, that have attracted my focus for, um, for my entire career, uh, having to do with the way that people uh, get what they need to get along, basically. Um, there was really no choice for me but to be an environmental historian, given the kind of background that I had. Uh, and I want to tell you just a little bit more about that, but let me, before I, before I do that, before I start the lecture, let me uh, explain what I, what I hope to do this evening. Um, I, I didn't really know what kind of audience I was going to get, and so I chose a number of different ways that I could approach this subject, put, crammed them all together into a lecture um, that is way too long. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is scroll through some of the slides without saying very much about them. Uh, if we want to come back to them uh, during the Q&A, and I really would like to leave enough time for, uh, for a good discussion. I know a lot of you, from the, the, just the conversations I had before the, the, uh, the lecture, a lot of you have uh, um, interests and in, in, uh, research background in this area of your own. So I'd like to leave time to, to, for us to, to, uh, to share that. Um, but I have one or two case studies that I will focus on. Uh, there's, a, there's a question in the back of all of this. The, the question I think that um, I've taught a number of food courses along with uh, uh, and, and done a whole range of public presentations now in, in uh, the United States. Uh, and in Vietnam and in India uh, about food. And um, there's, a, there's a big question in the back, that's always in the back of the room that um, um, if it's not there, it probably should be there, that, that sometimes we begin to talk about but then dodge. And that is, what kind of food, sy food systems are we going to have in the future that are going, going to be adequate? Not just, I mean, when I talk about food systems, not just production systems, but but also uh, distribution systems and so on, uh, that are going to be adequate to, to, um, to manage, uh, to, to uh, meet the needs of a rapidly growing world population. Um, and many of the discussions that we have about food talk about one particular problem or another, but they don't address that larger issue, especially as this discussion has fallen out in the United States, as it has located itself around uh, a set of points, uh, a binary, um, that has become a debate. Now what I've discovered giving lectures elsewhere, mostly to middle uh, class uh, educated audiences, is that they're making the same arguments, the same points of contention are structuring their discussions of, 
about food too. So I have a summary of those at the very end of the lecture that I want to leave you with, but just to let you know that's the direction that I'm heading. At the same time, that I would like to step back from our discussions of, of food and simply state the obvious. Raise some of the issues that we always talk about that are there, we take for granted. Uh, I hope that you won't find this a little too obvious, but I'll go fast enough that when it, when it feels that way, there'll be another one coming along in a minute. Um, kind of like bad comedy, or good comedy that starts out bad and then it comes good. Tell enough jokes, wrap enough pace, and eventually people start to laugh. So I uh, hope we can do that with your level of interest. Okay, first of two, uh, another word or two about my background in addition to what uh, Todd said. One of the things that I always like to do, um, we always do this when we, when we begin a talk, is that who am I and who are these people? What are we doing here? Um, the question that environmental historians always ask is what is this place and, and what place did I come from? Uh, and I've lived in a lot of places now. As Tom mentioned, I, I lived in Georgia for 15 years. It was initially almost a study abroad experience for me. It was so strange compared to the place that I grew up. But the, pla the place where I grew up was a mountain landscape, quite a bit different than this one. Um, there are some snow-capped peaks uh, to the west of this uh, North Fork of the John Day River. Um, but it was also on the edge of, of, of several landscapes, and as we know from uh, the ecological sciences, edge places, ecotones, uh, and places on the edges are very rich places of uh, all kinds of things. Um, here's another slide from the same place, a historic slide, the Columbia River. Uh, the Blue Mountains are adjacent to the Columbia Plateau uh, of eastern Washington and eastern Oregon. The Columbia River, of course, originates in Canada, the Snake River, which um, has a watershed that stretches all the way across uh, Idaho to the Rocky Mountains feeds into it. It's one of the big rivers of the, the American West. Um, and this is a, a food exchange system in operation here. These are the Salilo Indians fishing for the migratory salmon that go up the Columbia River, used to go up the Columbia River every year in large numbers uh, to spawn. Um, this beautiful area is one of those thing, um, landscapes from my very early childhood that I actually remember um, because it was so striking. Uh, when I saw it, um, was two years later inundated by uh, a hydroelectric dam, one of those big dams that turned the Columbia River uh, into a series of lakes. Sockeye salmon is one of the best. We get a lot of these in Bellingham. Um, this is an iconic uh, food from the Pacific Northwest. Um, these, this particular species of salmon, there are several, never makes it out of the Pacific Northwest. If you want to eat it, you need to come there. Uh, you won't find it in New York delis. Our king salmon sometimes will go there, but um, it's a wild salmon. It's incredible flavor, and if you want some idea of size, about like that. You know, it's a good sockeye, several pounds, big fish, great food. Um, but, there, but, but you come down out of the mountains and it looks like this. Uh, cattle raised, cattle country, rodeo country. My home, the town where I went to high school, Pendleton High School, was, was the home of one of the big rodeos of the West, Pendleton Roundup. Um, it's, a, it's an area that, that once uh, was occupied by Umatilla, Cayuse, Walla Walla, and Nez Perce Indians. Um, now, uh, but eventually, this is part of the environmental story of this region, uh, eventually uh, forced to live on the, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla uh, Indian Reservation. A place where there were uh, settled uh, uh, yeoman farmers, small-scale farmers, and people living in the woods, like my family. This is my grandparents' house, where I spent much of my childhood. Modest means, people of modest means, who, um, this, you know, my, my people settled there in, in 1865 as part of that unhappy but also interesting story of settler, settler colonialism, um, uh, who lived there long enough to become natives themselves and for whom enough was enough. Uh, Large-scale industrial production was often uncomfortable for them, um, partly because that extractive economy had an end point and it reached its end point in the mid-20th century and began to disintegrate, which is why my generation, everyone left. I guess in some ways we were environmental refugees. Um, and this was another kind of extraction along with cattle and sheep ranching um, and, uh, and, and logging, large-scale wheat ranches. This is where I got my first agricultural experience, industrial production. And this picture in the lower uh, right-hand corner, I put in there deliberately, this is a wheat scientist 
um, down on the ground. My first experience uh, with agriculture outside of the gardens and the farms of our neighborhood was, as Tom mentioned, at an agricultural experiment station, a research station. It was part of this large industrial wheat complex. And in fact, my first job there was counting wheat down on the ground in these little plots, four rows, eight feet long, um, had to be monitored carefully. They hired people like me, 16-year-olds in high school, to crawl around on our hands and knees and count the number of stocks in each row, the two middle rows. The outside two rows were on each plot, control plot rows. So I got a, a really good view of wheat from the ground up. At the same time, um, when I looked up, I sometimes saw Japanese agronomists. Uh, it was my first experience with the rest of the world, my first experience with people with advanced degrees. The Japanese had begun brought, buying Pacific Northwest wheat. They were um, interested in protein contents. My older sister, in fact, this was gendered work. She was inside testing the protein content of this wheat um, to see which varieties would be best to export. I later learned that this wheat complex was part of the larger um, uh, industrial um, agricultural surplus program, the food assistance program, uh, part of the Green Revolution, part of American foreign policy during the Cold War. Um, some of the wheat that was grown in this region was exported to India. Uh, you may know something about this story. I have a student who did a research paper in, in Goa just last week, just turned it in last week about how the Indians were manipulated into buying American wheat in the 1960s, in some ways almost coerced, uh, and then to grow wheat uh, with long-term consequences that were not so good. Uh, and there I was on the ground, crawling around on my hands and knees, looking at this wheat um, as it was coming up out of the ground, um, and at the same time, gradually developing an awareness of how it was connected to this global system of food production, foreign policy, and everything else. Uh, a really great experience for me, and one that I've continued to build on. All right, one of the things that we always do when we begin to talk about food, at the very beginning, and sometimes at the end, too, sometimes these discussions end up with, in, in um, I know from, from food historians, often end up as, as discussions about recipes and things like that, is what did you have for dinner? Uh, you can look at what you had for dinner and find out everything, all kinds of things about food systems. And you may know about this series of photographs that was done in 2008 by Philip Menzer. I've extracted just a few of them from this long series. Um, this one in Kuwait City I put in because the two maids uh, pictured here are uh, Nepali. And uh, I understand that this kind of labor uh, export is, uh, is something that social science bought, in fact, has studied. Um, you can learn a lot by looking at the food that people buy and have in their homes. And you see here uh, a, a, a food supply that is structured by processed, industrially produced food, purchased at the supermarket. Um, this is a characteristic American cuisine. Um, it, it differs from place to place. If you're interested in looking at these, almost everyone is. You can find them online. Uh, as part of the Hungry Planet series. It was published first in Time Magazine in 2005, I guess. Now what this does and what it connects to is, um, is a kind of study that uh, was developed first by anthropologists and, uh, and where we can find the roots or the origin of food studies across the disciplines, in fact. A classic essay by Mary Douglas, uh, Deciphering a Meal in Daedalus in 1972. Uh, and then a, then a book uh, later um, that she published in 1982 that asks us to look at meals in particular. Look at a meal, look at the, what, what, the, what you have, uh, where it came from, how it was produced, where you got it, uh, what kind of cuisine it connects to, why you chose to do it in that way, and so on. And you can learn everything about, um, about the culture that you live in, sometimes about other cultures as well. Um, this essay, by the way, is almost unreadable, but, um, but it has to be mentioned because it was an important uh, route. A, a much simpler uh, um, uh, origin story is the one that um, I, he says that he didn't say this, Donald uh, Worcester, environmental historian, but one of the pioneering environmental historians um, said back in the 1980s that environmental history begins in the belly. 
So environmental history in one way or another is, has always been connected with food studies. It was a really important book. You know, I, Tom talked about how I studied the relationship between rice and power. Um, it's impossible to, to, to look to analyze a rice production system without also talking about power. Because the control, a rice production system that tries to grow rice in large quantities. Because the control of water to grow uh, rice, to maximize the production of rice, always requires some kind of organization, political and social organization. Uh, the control of water and power, structures, uh, structures of power, are always linked. So rice and power, the production of rice on a large scale, uh, is always connected to, to other things. What Sidney Mintz did in this pioneering book, enormously influential book, published in 1985, The Sweetness of Power, is he looked at the way that power and the production of sugar were historically linked early in the history of this, but also used it as a kind of set piece. Sugar in the Caribbean, especially um, on uh, colonial sugar plantations, French, Spanish, and, and British, um, and, and, but also uses it to raise all kinds of questions about food. It's a kind of primer for food studies that uh, allows us to look at, very simply, how sugar became a world commodity from nothing to something. I mean, he points out that humans always look for some kind of sweetness, but sugar wasn't the answer to that in most places. Uh, sh sugar of different kinds, perhaps, in India, my students have taught me a lot about jaggery and about date palm sugar, um, uh, honey, uh, sweetness as it is, is, uh, is, is a part of the, 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 the fruit that we eat, uh, and so on, but not the kind of sugar that we now uh, use as the main source uh, of sweetness that became an important source of sweetness beginning in the 17th 18th and then especially in the 19th century. So you can learn about this story, but you can also learn uh, about how to analyze food. Um, Mintz distinguishes between external and internal factors when we look at food. External, personal ambitions, you look at the history of, of, of a food system. Personal ambitions, political agendas, all these, I'm not going to read this for you, but um, but all kinds of things that are actually external to the food itself and to what we actually say about why we uh, eat that food. Industrial agriculture, agricultural research and innovation are important external factors. Uh, and you know, as I indicated in my own experience, I learned about this firsthand when I worked on an agricultural experiment station. Internal factors are the ones that we usually talk about when we talk about food. Taste, not just the physiological experience of taste, but you know, comfort food. Taste is tradition. Taste is part of a religious ritual. Taste is your mother made this, and so it's a lot better than the, than the same thing that you, um, that somebody else made, uh, or that your father made, or that you bought in a restaurant. Um, the, the the food is a way to consolidate relationships. Food is is, is nourishment. Food as something that you choose. And Big C here quite deliberately. Food is something you choose. How we get what we eat is one of the most important external factors, and I, I want to, to, to tell a couple of my case studies really focus on this. Um, very, very generally, you know about this, so I'm going to skim over it. The difference between subsistence agriculture and industrial agriculture are, um, have historically been massive ones. Uh, the uh, industrial agriculture, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this in a minute. But we really, um, in the production of sugar, see the development of the very first industrial agricultural systems in the world. It's really kind of interesting that it's sugar, something you don't necessarily need. It's not one of the main staples. It's, it's not rice or, or, or wheat or barley. It's, it's something that um, was, was often extraneous um, to, 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 to food um, systems. But, um, but it was grown on a large scale uh, for the first time on these sugar island plantations, colonial plantations, using slave labor. It's brutal work. Sugar growing is brutal work, very, very difficult work. It's one of the reasons why uh, it was done uh, using slave labor is because most people refused to do the work. Sugar cane is very heavy. Uh, it's, a, it's a hot environment. Um, the soils were heavy to work, but the cane especially. 
uh, and the harvesting of the cane requires you to bend over, uh, cut the cane with a kind of machete with a hook on the end of it, uh, and then haul the cane to a nearby cart. And it has to be done very quickly because when the sap is at the, has the right sugar content, um, you lose sugar if you don't do it quickly. It has to be harvested when the, 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 the pitch of the sap is just right. Um, so there's, there's usually an overseer there. There was always an overseer pushing slaves along. It was also um, the first uh, agricultural product. I mean, we, we can talk about the grains being ground in, um, in mills also being produced by, or processed by industrial means. But it was the first agricultural product that was processed by, uh, had to be processed by industrial means. You can't grind this, this by hand, or you can, but the sap that you extract from it, and we've seen lots of these um, mechanisms, in fact, on every Indian street corner for extracting sugar uh, sap from some sugar cane, does not produce very much in the way of sugar. In order to get sugar, in order to get refined sugar, you have to cook it, which requires sugar houses. Uh, and it requires a great deal of expertise as well. Um, and the, the end product is highly refined white sugar as well as some less refined brown sugar and molasses. Um, and uh, the white sugar, of course, of the, uh, fetched the highest price on the market. Now, these industrial enterprises grew uh, in scale uh, as the sugar growing sector also expanded in the 17th and, eight, and 18th and 19th. These are these three slides are in fact respectively from 17th, 18th, and 19th uh, century uh, sugar growing or sugar processing uh, enterprises. Interestingly enough, as sugar became available, the French discovered pastries. And you can date the first pastry cookbooks with the arrival of sugar uh, in Europe in quantities large enough for people actually to make something out of it, not to simply treat it as a medicine or as sometimes luxury. Uh, the mid 18th century, the first pastry and cookbooks, it was at first something that fed the appetites of the elite. They used it for sugar sculptures, they used it for gifts to poor people in order to demonstrate their largesse. Um, here, here's a, a, a book that actually uh, depicts how to make uh, place settings out of sugar. Uh, it was an important marker of prestige, but it also began to be used increasingly for sweets and pastries and jams and cakes and meringues and so on. Um, it became part of a really important ritual. It's hard to believe that this was not there for all time, that the British didn't some, somehow spring out of the earth with a teacup in their hands uh, because the tea ceremony is so important to them. But it evolved hand in hand with the development of the tea service as a ritual. Pastries uh, with tea and certainly sugar for tea it was a very, became a very important part of um, elite British uh, culture by the 18th century. <coughs> in all places, in the colonies as well. By the 19th century, Mintz points out, sugar was cheap enough. It had arrived in Europe in large enough quantities. It was cheap enough that it became almost a staple in the diets of the industrial poor, of industrial laborers. In many ways, it was, it was a product that was created on the backs of slaves. I am the sugar in the bottom of your cup. The Stuart Hall says uh, immigrants from the Caribbean uh, have argued uh, to the British when they've complained about them arriving. Uh, we're the ones who got you rich in the first place. Uh, but they also fueled uh, industrialization. Uh, sugar also fueled industrialization in the 19th century as a cheap food, a cheap source of calories uh, for the industrial poor. A big deal, in other words. Sugar, not one of the most important of foods, uh, became a very important one. By looking closely at its relationship to a number of cultural uh, um, and economic and political uh, developments, uh, as well as cuisine and taste developments, both internal and external factors, we can learn a lot about, uh, about everything. By the way, it's been reinvented by, uh, by colonists uh, and uh, it has become an important part of uh, Indian culture as well, in I think a much better form. Uh, tastes a lot better than English tea usually does. Um, milk tea and so on, it's, it's pretty tepid stuff. Uh, chai is much tastier, it's got some spices in it. 
Um, all of this history encapsulated in this wonderful sculpture by Kara Walker in 2014, um, the Sugar Sphinx, made of white refined sugar, um, bleached sugar. Sugar is originally brown, as she points out in her description of this project. Uh, the history of this has been, in other words, bleached and sanitized and only by recovering the brownness of that history will we recover um, the relationship between race and sweetness uh, in a way that will continue to help us do deal with um, one of the enduring problems in American society, the, the problem of race. Big deal, huh? Yeah, it's a pretty big deal. All of it about food. Here's another book and another way to think about food, and that has to do with um, the way that food moved around the globe um, as described so well by Alfred Crosby and Ecological Imperialism, the bio first in the Columbian Exchange, published in the mid-1970s. Nobody read that except for environmental historians. Uh, but in this book, which is widely, uh, uh, widely distributed, widely translated, perhaps the one book re read most uh, widely around the world and across disciplines um, by an environmental historian, um, Crosby talks about the, basically that exchange of organisms between Europe and the United States. And here I'm not going to even take a minute to look at this. It's an exchange that is very uh, deftly, I think, summarized by this uh, graphic. Um, Europeans got the better deal here. They got tomatoes, they got corn, they got potatoes. Imagine European and, in fact, world cuisines without these foods from the Americas. Um, Native Americans got pigs and micro and, and, and um, contagious diseases. Microorganisms that were unknown in North America and to which they had few immunities um, and that um, contributed to that sort of bundle of problems that, re that, um, that caused uh, mortality rates of between 80 and 90 percent in Native American populations everywhere in the Americas within 100 years after uh, their contact with Europeans. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we don't know very much about Native Americans, and we don't, is because they mostly disappeared within 100 years after contact. Um, and this was one of the reasons. So this was a, a really pretty big deal. Uh, and food was part of the package. Sometimes the two of them together, these diseases were zoonotic diseases. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, and you, it's hard to, in fact, I think it's hard to imagine the history of food anywhere without this exchange that began to take place at an accelerated rate with European discovery and colonization all over the world. Corn, maize is one of those world foods now. It used to be. It was a big deal in the Americas. This is the first depiction of maize in 14, 1542 by a European. They didn't really know what it was at first. Um, and I'm sorry I don't remember this very well, but I do remember an essay that I read in graduate school by Carl Sauer, who speculated that the term maize, which came from a Spanish term for corn, was directly linked to or a form um, of uh, the word for millet. Uh, because the Spanish at first, that's what they thought it was. They didn't know what corn was. But when they discovered what it was, and they discovered that they, 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 could, they could feed themselves growing corn instead of wheat and barley, uh, in most places in the Americas, they began to grow it and then export it. I'm going to scroll through this quickly. If you want to talk about this later, we can. Uh, the story of corn in the United States is a really big deal. It's the ultimate corn American food. But it's also really important and even crucial to food systems in other parts of the world. The history of corn is a corn of industrial, is history of industrialization, new financial arrangements, growth of scientific expertise. Most importantly, the one of the things that you can learn from the history of corn is, but look, is you can learn a great deal about um, the role of science in developing new kinds of seeds, hybrid seeds first and then GMO seeds, um, and ways that the manipulation of seeds were used to, um, to increase uh, uh, production. Corn is a tr tricky plant. It, it required genetic modification before you could grow um, larger quantities of it on the same uh, 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 
amount of land. Um, previous to that, the only way to expand production was to expand the, the, the area of production, which, uh, and there's an economy of scale that operates there. Um, so that there's limited returns after a certain point. So, so hybrid production of hybrid seeds and then GMO seeds have been enormously important. Corn is also uh, grown on a large scale when it could be um, harvested by machine. So this is a, a big story. The, the, again, the, the, the history of hybrid corns. But then there's also another story that uh, I don't, I don't you know, when I query people outside the United States, they don't know very much about this. Uh, but the, the, the history of different of new industrial milling techniques, along with the development of super sweet corns in the 1980s and 1990s, originally developed in the 1950s, but not grown on a large scale until the 1980s. And this is wet culture corn production, dry culture corn and corn milling. Dry culture corn milling uh, grinds corn and produces uh, flour uh, and, 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 and corn kernels. Um, wet culture breaks corn into its constituent parts and then puts them together again. One of the main products of this process is um, corn syrup, but all kinds of other things. So the 45,000 items in a modern American supermarket, more than 25% contain some form of corn. Usually corn syrup. And one of the things, I don't know if you're one of those people who obsessively read ingredients label, labels if, if they're available, but I do that. And I certainly started doing that in India and I've discovered that on soft drinks and fruit drinks and so on, you don't find corn syrup, you still find sugar. Um, corn syrup is a simpler sugar, it's absorbed rapidly into the body. Um, and some uh, food writers have blamed the American epidemic uh, in obesity, dating back to the late 1990s to the arrival of corn syrup in just about everything uh, in American food products. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to argue that sugar is a better thing than corn syrup, uh, but maybe it is. Um, anyway, Americans have corn in them in all kinds of ways, uh, and it has not really been a good thing. So what I want to talk about today, the, the case study that I want to focus on, because it's so rich, and because it also demonstrates what Tom mentioned in his introduction, which is that sometimes food bites back. Um, that not only chews back, but it bites back in a big way, uh, is the history of industrial chicken production. Now this is also something that's relatively new. Uh, we, we have some very good scholarship on this that dates the um, evolution of industrial chicken production uh, to the modern systems for industrial chicken production to the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. By the 1970s, um, the modern form of industrial chicken production was in shape. This is an egg producing factory, but chicken producing factories are structured mostly in the same way with chickens in individual stalls. Um, and a particular kind of chicken in enclosed spaces, chickens aren't very resilient. They can't handle much of a, of a uh, temperature increase unless they can hide out in the shade somewhere. Uh, a change of, of, of 10 degrees or, or more in temperature, I don't know exactly what the threshold is, uh, will kill chickens in very large numbers all at once. So these are climate controlled warehouses as well. It's a, it's a very controlled environment. Uh, chickens are, are now a really uh, a technological um, um, uh, artifact. They're, they're, they're part of a larger system um, rather than something that has direct links to uh, the soils and the foods and the climate and so on in which we think uh, food organisms uh, uh, usually come from. At the same time, chickens themselves have been restructured. This is the modern chicken. Um, and designed so that it will, it, it can be harvested in six weeks rather than eight or three months. I grew up in the country. We actually waited until the hen was finished laying at about two years old, and then we boiled it because it was too tough to fry. It was a stewing hen, it became a stewing hen. You know, it's a much different way of thinking about chickens. Uh, if you had company over for a Sunday dinner, then you went out and you found something that was uh, 
that a, a, a chicken that, that was not mature yet, that was less than a year old, and you harvested it. Not six weeks, because most chickens are not mature in six weeks. Um, they've also been designed to produce large quantities of breast meat, because America, that's what consumers want. Sometimes so much that they can't um, stand up. That's why one of the reasons for these small cages in which they're produced. Now this is where this comes from. This is the ancestor of chickens. Uh, the red jungle fowl of southern China and northern Vietnam. I've seen some chickens in, uh, yeah, I got the picture. In Margao, I took these pictures. I don't know what the story is here. I was able to take a photograph without, um, uh, without uh, asking enough questions to find out what the story is. But, but you know, these, these American chickens, as they're called in many places, uh, are, are still subverted in other places by, uh, by just to give you an idea of how weird this chicken is, this, this industrial chicken. Here's what, this, is the, this resembles the kind of chickens that I saw in Vietnam running around in backyard poultry operations. Very long legs, very tough, not much breast meat, able to take care of themselves so fast that I have trouble taking pictures of them, living off the land. Um, occasionally one of them gets in the way of a car uh, speeding down the road, but actually pretty adept at getting out of the way of automobiles as well. Not a lot of meat, uh, dark meat mostly, and meat with character that chews back. The Vietnamese, many of them, rural Vietnamese especially, still prefer this kind of chicken to the ga kanya, the industrial chicken, or the ga mi, white, the, the white meat chicken, uh, as, they, as they also call it, call it. This is the ga debo, the, the chicken that walks and runs around. So um, it's a particular kind of chicken produced in a particular kind of way. Now to make another leap here. Any monoculture is hog heaven for those things that feed on it. And one of the, the organisms, if you want to call it that, that does really well in chicken monocultures, of the kind that you find in industrial chicken productions, are influenza viruses. They're endemic to migratory birds and also to some chicken populations. Can't ever really eradicate them. But they can be controlled. You know something about how viruses, this is a, a, a photograph from, uh, um, that was produced by the Vietnamese government um, during the avian flu epidemics of 2003-04 and 05 and 06. Excuse me, 45 million birds culled. It was a chicken holocaust. Not just industrial chickens, in fact, mainly not industrial chickens, but backyard poultry, so it, was a, it had enormous social impact. People who raise a few chickens, some of you have worked on, on these kinds of food systems, who raise a few chickens, um, they don't, it doesn't seem like much. 15 or 20 chickens running around your yard, but yet they take care of themselves, they don't require inputs, um, they maybe some cracked rice from the bottom of the barrel, and now and then, or the bottom of the bag. Um, they, they, um, they have offspring that are like uh, money in the bank, acquiring interest. Uh, they produce eggs. They sometimes are, are one of the only sources of a cash income uh, for a household. They're extremely important. It was a, it, so this, this, um, the, the slaughter of chickens by, by um, the, the Food and Agricultural Association, uh, the, the, the uh, Ministry of, of Rural Development in Vietnam in tandem with the FAO, the UNFAO, uh, had enormous uh, social impact on rural uh, Vietnamese. Um, and uh, they were compensated, but only a tiny amount. In Cambodia, they couldn't find a way to compensate farmers there that worked because of political corruption, and so they weren't even compensated. Um, it really had enormous social impact. Anyway, consumers, Vietnamese consumers, partly because of posters such as this, also became terrified of chickens that were not, uh, all chickens, in fact. In fact, there was a brief period between in 2003-04 when Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is the first fast food chain to gain a real foothold in modernizing Vietnam, was not able to find a chicken supply and so they sold uh, catfish, it was Kentucky Fried Catfish, KFC, it still, still works. Um, the microorganism, the H5N1 microorganism, which emerged during this season, this avian flu organism, had a very high mortality rate when it jumped to humans. Not very many humans 
got the disease because usually influenza, of course, is transmitted by drops of saliva when you cough them, sneeze them out uh, into the air. And so transmission is really rapid. It's one of the reasons why there are influenza epidemics all over the place every season. But, um, but this kind of influenza strain could, could, could be communicated from birds to humans or from humans to humans only by coming in contact with fluids of the infected organism uh, or in the, in the case of bird to human, the blood or the animal right after it had been um, uh, 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 butchered. So it was very difficult to get this disease, but the mortality rate was very high, about 30% of those people who did contract the, the disease, and it was impossible to really do anything about it. Uh, at a certain point in progression of the disease, massive uh, uh, quantities of Tamiflu, the, really the only uh, um, drug that is effective against viruses and doesn't cure the, cure viruses, it just simply reduces the symptoms, um, sometimes helps, but, um, but there are all kinds of problems with that and reasons that it didn't work. Now you're familiar with zoonotic diseases, diseases that we share with animals as co-hosts. Um, the influenza viruses are one of these. Uh, of these diseases, I know you're familiar with them because I saw an article just yet, two days ago in the Himalaya. Uh, maybe you didn't read this, but it was kind of a, in, a, in a dark way interesting to me that I opened this newspaper my first morning in, in Nepal and I saw this article about this dengue-like illness um, in a particular province in Nepal. It, it mimics, it looks like, it acts like deng dengue fever but it's not, it's something else. It's an emerging disease, a, a disease caused uh, by a virus, um, a mosquito, where the mosquitoes are the vector. At the same time, I opened the New York Times and saw on the front page of the New York Times a report uh, about uh, a, a recent Centers for Disease Control report that um, talked about a 17% increase in diseases like, um, like West Nile disease and Lyme disease last year in the United States, diseases again, zoonotic diseases, that, um, that they linked possibly to climate change. Of these diseases, virus-caused diseases are the most problematic because, um, they, because there's no effective antibiotic against virus-caused diseases, one that actually will kill the virus, like there are bacteria-caused diseases, but also because viruses are strange organisms. They're not really organisms in the way that bacteria are. They, they don't have an independent exi existence. They live by combining their genetic material with the genetic material of their hosts. They combine and recombine. I hope there's no, there are no virologists in the, in the audience because I can't really explain this very well. But they reproduce rapidly by combining and recombining. They evolve rapidly. They evolve very rapidly, which means that they develop new strains all the time. They can work their way around antibiotics or efforts to control them, hygienic efforts to control them in ways that uh, make them uh, especially volatile and especially dangerous. Health experts were concerned about this avian flu, uh, uh, H5N1, because it resembled genetically not quite the same. And it's important that there was a big, a, a big small, a small bit but, but nonetheless big, genetically big difference between this one and the influenza strain that caused the 1918 Spanish influenza uh, epidemic. By the way, another story that was first explained by Alfred Crosby and by environmental historians uh, 30 and 40 years ago, Crosby's book was published in the 1970s. Nobody read it, absolutely no one. It was republished in the 1990s and every day lots of people read it. Um, when we began to wor be worried about emerging diseases, partly because of the HIV AIDS epidemic, which was originally a disease that was shared uh, with, with, um, with, organ with bushmeat uh, in, in, in Africa, um, be we, we, we became interested in this, this terrible disease, this terrible epidemic that circulated the globe, called the 1918 influenza epidemic, but actually uh, circulated over the course of a couple of years, infected people at remote sites all over the world with deaths of 50 to 100 million, more than World War I, an, an incredible disaster, not understood very well, but a disaster also because the, of the epidemiological profile. Influenza epidemic every, uh, epidemics every year kill uh, people who are 
whose immune systems are weak or not very well developed, the very young and the very old. This one killed at a higher rate people at, who were at the prime of their health. And um, the explanation, the one that, that is best perhaps, is that these were the people um, that, that it caused the immune systems to overreact. So people with strong immune systems um, uh, responded in a really powerful way, so powerful that their lungs were, were uh, drowned with fluid and they quite literally drowned. This is what world health experts and others were worried about with this avian flu epidemic. That it would make that genetic leap, which would make it possible for human to human transmission at a very rapid, a much faster pace because of air travel, and we would have a genuine pandemic. Now they still believe, by the way, that this is possible. World health experts say it's not simply a matter of if we'll have such a pandemic, but when. There are lots of variables here, lots and lots of questions, but the point that I want to make is that our food here bites back. Um, these are slides or images, by the way, photographs that I took in 2000 and 2001 before this happened. You don't see this anymore in Vietnam. It had an enormous impact on how chickens were produced. First of all, transformed the production of chickens. They're now produced mostly by these large CP Thailand and Cargill by an industrial system that's been exported from the United States all over the world. Because, what? Just about done. People were worried about, um, about uh, these chickens and so those who could afford to do so changed their habits and began buying industrial produced chickens in the modern supermarkets that are growing, uh, that, are, that are popping up all over the place as Vietnam expands. Um, the chicken markets, the wholesale markets of, of Ho Chi Minh City were moved to the outskirts of the city where they could be controlled uh, much better. Um, it also transformed the institutions and approaches to emerging diseases in Vietnam in a way, a number of ways that are really significant. Uh, in other words, chickens here had an enormous impact in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. It's a story that in its scale is almost as large as, uh, and powerful as the story about sugar. Okay, I'm not going to tell you the apple story unless you ask me to, but what I want to do is to, is to provide you with um, the, the a brief outline of, the, um, of the, the terms of the debate as they've evolved in American uh, food activist circles. And as I've seen them, you know, last Saturday night in Goa, I gave a version of this lecture, and afterwards, maybe this will happen, I'm not going to warn you against this, uh, maybe I should just let, wait and see what happens. I had people who stood up and very, very passionately said, how can we get chickens that don't have antibiotics in them? And another kind of problem. How can we get food? The Indian, the, the, the control of the Indian government over pesticides is very weak. How can we, we, we get food that, doesn't, that, it, that hasn't been immersed in toxic pesticides? Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, a scientist from the uh, Goa uh, uh, poet, poultry, um, the public agency that monitors um, poultry production in Goa, stood up and lectured for a full half an hour uh, about antibiotics and why it was okay and why Goa chickens were just fine, don't worry, it's, it's okay. The, these, the, the, the terms of this debate, in other words, fell out in much the same way uh, and they have on a couple of other occasions when I've given this lecture in, in India, as they do in the United States. All right. Many food activists are fighting against the way that food is produced, modern food, fence-to-fence -fence homogeneity, monoculture, the development of these, these industrial creatures, the loss of biodiversity, large carbon footprints, um, in, you know, enormous inputs, Corn especially, many field crops require a lot of fossil fuels, factory farms, cruelty to animals, exploitation of labor, uh, not slaves anymore, but illegal immigrants paid uh, a pittance, um, the sovereignty of corn syrup with its consequences, just, met, just wait, it's going to arrive in, in, in Nepal at some point, uh, soon probably, fast food, faster food, uh, not very healthy food, profits to a small number of people and costs long-term costs to everyone else, 
Um, and also food that's really, really boring. This is what we're fighting against. What we're fighting for, Americans say, not shipping it in. Growing food local. Except, of course, for coffee, salt, bananas, all those things that we really need and like um, and, and want to import. Bananas in America. You know, Americans have to have bananas in the supermarket. Bananas are grown nowhere in the United States. Um, there are a lot of paradoxes here, and I, I want to, but to point out that you know one of the, the main activists in this conversation has been Michael Pollan, the food writer, and he's, he, he published a book about 15 years ago called The Omnivore's Dilemma, the, the question of choice, the, the American food in four meals. He analyzes four meals. You know, as it turns out, the omnivore's dilemma, you know, what are Americans, what should Americans choose when they can eat everything, when they're American, when humans are omnivores? It, as it turns out, it's more the middle class affluent American dilemma. But this is a dilemma that we see in middle class, uh, er, middle classes everywhere. Um, enormous increase in the production of beef worldwide, why? Because growing appetites for beef in the developing Chinese middle class, for example. All right, not shipping it in, that's what we're fighting for. Biological diversity and sustainability, allowing things to, to range, things that are grass-fed, grass roots. Uh, let those chickens roam around. There's now a big niche market in the United States in free-range chickens. Um, tiny ecological footprints, uh, internal inputs versus external. This is one of the things, by the way, that Vandana Shiva, uh, the food activist, uh, who I know has given, I just discovered, gave a, uh, a, a famous talk here, a, a talk here at Martin Chitari, I think that was, uh, in 2013. This is one of the things that she's talked about a great deal. Do things internal to the system. A lot more attention to the way you grow things, for example, uh, rather than growing things on a large scale with lots of external uh, inputs. Use compost instead of chemical fertilizers. Uh, cycle crops. Uh, in, in a way that will uh, not uh, deplete the soil. Family farms, farmer markets, respect for farmers and so on. And by the way, the farmer in chief here, this is a historical event where Michael Pollan actually wrote a letter to um, Barack Obama when he was elected to office and said, look, you have an opportunity here to set an example, teach us about healthy food. Michelle Obama took that seriously, started an organic garden right there on the, on the lawn of the uh, uh, White House and used it to educate young people about, uh, about healthy food. Food celebrities, food activists, there have been some, some food activists and food celebrities that have made a lot of money out of this, uh, this, this political act. Um, thinking about eating as an agricultural act, but also as an ecological and political one, not just as a way to get food, good food, uh, organic food, uh, adequate pay and services for agricultural workers, Fair trade, um, uh, good wages, in other words, for workers in places outside of the United States. Interesting and more varied, varied cuisines. Slow food, taking your time. This was a movement, actually, that, that developed and emerged in Italy first and now spread across the United States, across Europe, the United States. Taking your time, preparing food, using natural ingredients. This is a movement that our, our rural family members and so on in Vietnam, my wife is Vietnamese and grew up there, think is absolutely absurd. And I mean, we grew, we, we've always been slow food people. We spent most of our time, women spent most of their time preparing food, and you want us to give up our microwaves, you know? You want us to, to give up, to, to go back to that? You know, it's, it's just crazy. Um, all of these things. But if we do this, you know, if we destroy industrial agriculture, if we replace it with all these other things, can we feed everyone inadequately by exalting slow cuisines, uh, denigrating industrial food production, and everything that goes along with it? Um, can we actually feed, feed enough to, to feed? To, can we grow enough? Can we produce enough to feed people right now? Right now, let alone the future. And, and, and this is a movement that I, I want to point out has not paid very much attention to those basic food crops like wheat, barley, rice, sorghum, sorghum especially, a really important crop in Africa, spuds, potatoes, and so on. Uh, it's paid a lot more attention to other kinds of foods. So what do we do about those? What do we do about um, this, this larger problem of, uh, of, of, of hunger? 
Uh, is this simply a self-indulgent kind of middle class thing everywhere in the world to be concerned about food in these particular ways? Or, and this is a, a question that I don't see being asked enough, except by people who have worked outside of the United States, people have tried to look at food systems on a global scale and development strategies on a global scale. Is it possible to think about hybrid food systems where you have food produced, some food produced in some of the ways that we like it to be produced and some food produced in, by industrial agriculture? Or maybe both at the same time, much in the same way that integrated pest management works when it works. Um, and you, you, you sometimes use pesticides and sometimes use biological controls or you vary uh, the kinds of crops that you grow uh, in order to, to you use a whole number of adaptive strategies uh, to control pests instead of simply blitzing them with chemicals on the one hand or attempting to um, organically control them on the other. Uh, is it, it, can we develop hybrid systems that are going to work to solve this problem? Mm. Okay. Mm. That's the big question in the room. Um, if you also want me to go back and talk more about corn or about um, about apples, that apple story has um, has been pretty popular in India, uh, partly because a lot of the apples that they now eat there come from Washington State. Um, I can tell you that story, but otherwise, let's. I know a lot of you are doing really interesting work in this area. Let's hear about it. Okay. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions now. Um, time is limited, so if I can ask you to keep your question uh, very brief, we will take two or three questions at one time, and then sure. you can respond, and we'll take a few more questions. I think we have uh, a microphone, so please use the microphone. Um, who has questions? Please show one right here. And one right here, are the questions from besides the first row right here? Anybody else? Okay, right over there. So question here, question here, question there. Then we'll take out answers and then more questions. Please, sir. Yes, your presentation is very sensitive one. But one question is in my mind, what to do in everywhere there is not Good, good food with scientific way. Uh, all the thing is going on at randomly. Uh, then how we can slice the good for the sake of good health? Let me know the uh, uh, same thing. Thank you for giving the question brief. Uh, thank you, Professor Stewart, for your wonderful and very deep research you have presented. Uh, I would like to connect uh, uh, to the director, Mr. Robertson, and I, your research, because both of you come from environmental history. So, director, sir, just says nature is uh, not uh, a passive victim, but also an actor. And you uh, gave some reference to rice cultivation. So, I have once read a research that said that rice is a uh, the contributor of almost 20 percent of uh, impact on climate change that uh, all together was uh, from uh, food production. So together taking all food production, rice is a single contributor for climate change and it has 21 percent wages. So uh, with all these discussions saying, can we uh, be optimistic that uh, nature will someday try to balance all this thing, climate change and, and all uh, environmental disasters human beings are doing and uh, cultivation, food cultivation, like these things. So let's be optimistic, nature will give us some option. Okay, thank you. One question But usually when I see, when I hear about agriculture transition, it's often from um, food crop or subsistence farming to industrial and more far, uh, market or factory oriented farming, where monoculture is happening more than uh, multi-cropping. 
But when it comes to Nepal, except for a few areas where coffee, tea, or cardamom are produced uh, in a monoculture way, there are many areas where mixed farming is still practiced. And yet, industri not really industrialization, but then people are opting for cash crop farming, and they are focusing more and more on um, investing on one particular crop that provides income rather than maybe nutrition, variety of nutrition, or different kinds of landscapes in rural Nepal. In that context, how do you see the different kind of practices around the world and in Nepal where mixed farming is still practiced and we can say that maybe they are practicing a good food habit in some ways, but then there are still diseases or issues of pest management, people are going hungry because they don't have enough food to eat, and yet they are also struggling to earn enough cash, they're trying to diversify their livelihood, and people are also migrating from one place to the other, men are leaving, women are taking over the farms. How do you see all these things together? That's a great question. Actually, all of these are great questions. The first question, what, what can we do? Well, I, I should apologize for historians. And C.P. Snow wrote a great uh, essay, a really influential essay, back in the 1960s, an English scientist, the two minds of modern universities, uh, where he pointed out that scientists, that one of the reasons that the liberal arts is so difficult to, to program in the curriculum is because scientists and humanists operate in different ways. Um, and scientists are great at, at providing answers, they're great at solving problems, Humanists are great at, at, at creating, at, at, at asking questions. Um, they don't give answers very well sometimes. They're much better at raising questions and getting people to think about things and then find uh, answers on their own. So I can't claim to have an answer here. I do know that we need to step outside of this conversation that Americans are having um, and other parts of the world are having as well. We need to be really imaginative. About, um, about how we put together food systems. Um, I don't know about the, the, the thing about rice. My answer is to that is that there are, is some research that has att attempted to um, find ways to grow rice so that it doesn't emit as much methane. That's the main uh, greenhouse gas that emits. I'm not familiar with that research other than to know that some of my colleagues in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam have been involved in this. Um, another response to this, however, is that 20% maybe, and that's a kind of a high figure, but what about the other 80%? You know, I mean, rice actually gives us, it's the food system that gives us something. It's a relatively stable system, even if it does require a lot of management, um, ecologically a relatively stable system, one that in some places traditionally in the world has, has synced with ecological conditions. Um, you know, the ecologist Eugene Odom, one of the people, one of my mentors, in his textbook on ecology back in the 1950s, in fact, acknowledged that perhaps this was the one agroecological system that could have relatively strong, long-term stability, so rice plantations on the Yellow River, I mean, rice, uh, rice fields on the Yellow River in China. Um, so, you know, we don't want to get rid of rice for this reason, but, um, but there are other ways that we can work with this. Your question about Mixed farming, I think, gets right to the heart of things for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, you know, what I've, what I've traced here is a development trajectory that has replicated itself over and over again. And um, that doesn't mean that it has to. It doesn't mean, you know, there are other people who can speak to this better than I can. It, it doesn't mean that that's the way development has to proceed. Um, you have other options, and, and, and you know, as my colleagues in Vietnam have sometimes acknowledged and then turned their backs on it, um, the, there are other strategies that can be developed, and th those people who don't yet have to deal with the inertia of an already developed system have an opportunity to do something new that other parts of the world don't. So there are opportunities for really imaginative restructuring of agricultural systems as Nepal develops that might actually be a lesson for the rest of the world. Just very generally, I would say that. The other thing is that this is, solutions to this large global problem and so on are going to come from very close, discrete, nuanced, on-the-ground study 
by, uh, by committed individuals uh, and not from any kind of, uh, of, um, of, of study that is then generalized, um, not the kind of thing that historians sometimes do, but the kind of thing that, that uh, agricultural researchers do. Um, but they might need historians to help them tell the story. That's really what we do best, and to communicate those strategies to other people, uh, to publicize those strategies. You know, Michael Pollan, not a historian, but a very good one, not an academic historian, uh, but a great storyteller, acquired enormous power as a food activist, informing policy, telling the Obamas what to do, because he told good stories. So we need to also think about making this a multidisciplinary initiative as well. Scientists uh, and people in the social sciences and humanities working together to um, not only create good strategies, but then explain them. You know, I, it's a daunting challenge, though, when you get on the ground, I know. I've done enough research, historical research, to know exactly how difficult this is. And often, nature does not comply. That's the thing about rice agriculture, about chicken production and so on, is that you think you got everything worked out and managed, and then all at once, you know, chickens, rice, the weather, climate change, whatever, throws up some new variables, and you have to find a way to adapt. Um, it, things just don't work out the way you think they will. How we're going to um, find a solution to all of this, there's, there's a good answer to that and a bad answer. The good answer comes from one, another one of my mentors, the, the brilliant science fiction novelist and writer, Ursula Crover Le Guin, who died in February, one of the smartest women I've ever met, um, who said that we, we really need, this is a crisis of the imagination. We need imagination. We need to, to, to imagine new possibilities. And she was optimistic about the human ability to do that. The other side is, well, we're the weediest of creatures. Maybe the solution that Earth throws up at us is a massive pandemic. Enormous population decline. I heard the plant agronomist Wes Jackson speculate about this as a possibility. And that will take care of it. Some more questions? Yeah. Other questions, please. So right here, right here, and in the back there, please. People, I myself, I'm an agroforestry person yeah. as well as a farmer by choice. <coughs> so I grew a lot of food on my own backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of interesting things. Uh, two years back, I wrote an article for Springer Books. And this was meant for students of advanced education, especially in Asia so that they don't forget their roots. And it was called the indigenous knowledge and culinary practices in the Himalayas, Nepal Himalayas. Okay. So the idea, of course, here is uh, when I go to the Philippines and if I uh, drop into the Rice Research Institute, there's a very prominent graph, especially in the early millennium, which shows the population rise as well as how the modern world and the modern scientists are going to meet the food deficit. So that's a very prominent graph. And then you bring in a whole lot of activists from the NGO sector and you have a discussion saying what is the continuum between the answers we get from an industrialized food production to the ones that we are doing in our farmyards. And 30% of the food now is being grown on the terraces. Again, then we have some aquaponics as well as hydroponics, etc. So people are trying it out in pots and pans and rooftops, trying to bridge the population and the food deficit. Okay? So I think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. But uh, what I was really uh, interested was, as I'm working with the climate change and agriculture in the high mountains, and how this is being affected, I was trying to look into your presentation, two elements. There may be very many elements, but two elements. One is the role of pollinators, and we hear about the colony collapse disease, CCD. I'm sure it must have come from the West. It's all over. I have two beehives, and it's been lying empty for two years. But as I was growing up, we used to have log frames as well as African beehive. But you can see now in Nepal also, the, uh, the bees don't come back naturally. And it's just outside Kathmandu, it's about 15 kilometers, maybe not a very industrialized environment. The other thing I was really wondering was the role of water and moisture. So what we are finding in the high mountain is just not precipitation by rainfall, but also snow fed moisture. So I think these two factors are very important role to play in our food production. 
moisture and pollinators. And I would be trying to pick your brain saying, <laughs> how do you respond to this? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, my question is more like related with the what the bit I asked. My question is like uh, my comment actually would be like uh, at the moment uh, we all we all know that climate change has a lot of effect on production. So what I haven't seen in in villages, remote areas of Nepal that they are actually practicing the old cultural method, like indigenous technique. They are still using that. And the thing is that like what what we should do is the the things they are actually doing right now. But the problem is uh, things are changing. Things are becoming unpredictable. Like, you can't predict what's happening. And there are like certain plants which used to grow earlier. Now it's not producing, the, it's not growing anymore. So these things are showing up. So how can you, you know, like how can we uh, tackle these kind of problems uh, related to food, in, in terms of food security? How do we grow more food and still practice those indigenous technologies, you know? Like, yeah, great question. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the back, please. Hello. Yeah. Um, great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm from Georgia, actually, uh, and um, I grew up on a farm. Yeah, Where in Georgia? Uh, North Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my family's in the wine industry. Uh, I grew up on our uh, vineyard and. I guess my question, or really, it's just a request of you to discuss more of this, the future of this, uh, it's this contemporary infatuation with organic and this um, uh, almost senseless infatuation coupled with um, the industrialization and how um, perhaps these two can come together in a more um, efficient way, I guess. Um, so yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Um, you know, I'm really flattered that you think I can answer these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your faith in me. You know more than I do about some of these things. Um, you know, I think that, that looking at indigenous practices um, is important everywhere. And one of the things that I try to uncover in my work on Georgia rice agriculture, example, for example, was that one of the, the reasons, I mean, it looks on the face of it, it looked like rice planters were engineering nature in a way that made it more predictable and made it possible for them to tap natural energy sources with more and more predictability to grow larger and larger quantities of rice. But in fact, the system, in many more ways than one, rested on the backs of African Americans who did the work because that's what gave the system resilience. Was whenever there was a problem, and there was often, every couple of weeks, then um, African American slaves were put out into the fields to fix it, to take care of it. Often the knowledge of the planter was important, but African American knowledge was important as well. They may have, in fact, taught planters how to grow rice in the first place. So, you know, everywhere it's important to recover these systems and then recover how these systems get, um, get woven into other kinds of systems. Um, not necessarily to extract them, but to find a middle ground. So there are all kinds of reasons why this is important work. I can't really respond to your question about, about pollinators. Um, that is a crisis, perhaps eventually, on the scale of some influenza pandemic or some kind. If we don't have pollinators, uh, we're in big trouble. Water is, is going to, is already one of the, the the biggest issues of the 21st century. Water supplies, how we manage it. In my own uh, research, the Mekong Delta and the Mekong Basin, one of the most, you know, there are people who quite literally live in the water in Vietnam. Uh, a watery landscape in every kind of way. It's now a huge problem because of the construction of hydroelectric dams. Not only the, the, re the reduction of water supply, but climate change that has, um, that has meant that those pulses that they depended upon uh, have changed. And hydroelectric dams upriver have also changed that. How do you manage that? How do you, how do you manage you know, environmental governance across boundaries? It's really a problem. Um, Small-scale adaptive agriculture 
In some ways, small-scale agriculture is more resilient than large-scale areas. But in other ways, it isn't if um, the margin of security is really small. So support systems are crucial. But this is a, this is a huge area of study, I know, for people who are working in this area. It's really a great question. I don't have any absolute answers to it, except just push on and think about every single place that you study as a, as a possible test case for, um, for, for resilience and building resilience. Um, you know, the problem of what you do about farmers who want to make more money and want to be more affluent um, is you, know, you can't very, very well tell them you know, it's much better for you to do things this way when they would rather be middle class. Um, you know, especially we can't tell them that. It's very condescending. So that's another kind of social, cultural problem that experts, I've talked to several people here in Nepal who have acknowledged that as a problem that experts have to deal with as well. So it's a really complicated problem. The question of organic, that's a much bigger problem than I sketched it out to me because what has happened with organic, I can tell you as a 46, <laughs> Uh, year veteran of making compost, um, who actually went on compost pilgrimages to places where people tried to teach us how to make it um, when I, back in the 1970s, is that organic now has become a political category and a designation. And so in order to be designated organic, food has to be grown in a certain way according to certain kinds of uh, definitions. This has had the effect of pushing a lot of small producers, ironically, out of the market. Because meeting those demands, um, only large producers have had the, um, the, the margin, the capital, to do that, to let land lay fallow for several years and build food webs so that they can acquire that organic designation uh, and then sell to that niche market. So it's a really complicated political category as well as an ecological or an agricultural one. And my, my colleagues in India say the same thing has happened there. So I don't know what to do about that. Um, I, I think that a little bit more tolerance for almost organic. Yeah. You know, like my dad used to grow in our gigantic garden. You know, when he saw a pest, he would go out there and sometimes apply some rope node or, and, you know, an organic pesticide of some kind and target those pests in highly specific ways. But. We wash them really well. Wash those vegetables, the cabbages, really well. Almost organic. Almost organic. Yeah. Almost organic. I wish we had a little more tolerance for that. But again, yeah. excuse me. Again, develop those hybrid systems that don't go either, that aren't either or. Thinking about the debate, reorganizing the debate and the conversation in a new way is really crucial to to doing that. People are really passionately committed to these positions. You know, they get into fist fights after talks in the United States. You know? yeah. Are there more questions? All right, in that case. Question? I thought I saw one there. No? No. Okay. That. In that case, let's give Professor Stewart another round of applause.